Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the tragedy at Jonestown. And specifically, I've seen questions about Jim Jones. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So I'm going to divide this video into the background of Jim Jones, then look at the timeline of the crimes, and then look at the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, James Jones was born on May 13, 1931, in Crete, Indiana. His family had financial struggles. His mother claimed that she had visions when she was pregnant that indicated Jones would be a great religious leader. She would remind Jones of this remarkable destiny quite regularly. So what could go wrong with that strategy? As a child, Jones was described as odd, obsessed with death, and highly interested in religion. He killed several small animals, and he regularly held funerals for dead animals. He often shot friends with a BB gun, so like an air gun that shoots BBs, and he even fired a real gun at one of his friends. I don't know why they remained friends with him. He was able to memorize long passages from scripture. This kind of reminds me of David Koresh from the Waco tragedy. Jones' father died in 1947. Jones did not attend the funeral, and neither did his mother. Because of his father's death and the loss of financial support that came with that, Jones had to take a job at a local hospital. People reported that he seemed to tolerate aspects of that job that other people did not like. For example, handling corpses. In the early 1950s, he gained experience working with different church organizations and eventually started his own church. He promoted racial equality, but it wasn't clear if he genuinely believed that or if he saw an opportunity to gain power and influence. For example, many of the anecdotes he talked about where he fought for racial equality turned out to be false. As he progressed through his career as a religious leader, he became known as the mind-reading preacher. He would pay attention to all the details that people talked about and bring them up later as if he was able to read their thoughts. Jones grew in popularity because of his altruistic acts and his message of social justice. Members of his congregation noted that he reached out to minority communities and he often cared for the elderly. Jones staged an assassination attempt. He made it look like somebody tried to kill him, but the police didn't believe it. The members of his congregation, however, did believe it. He then came up with this conspiracy theory that the government was trying to destroy Indianapolis with a nuclear weapon. He moved to Brazil for a while, but that didn't work out. He came back to Indiana to find that his people's temple, as he called it, was in disarray. In 1965, still using the conspiracy theory about Indianapolis exploding as motivation, he convinced 100 of his followers to come with him to California, eventually establishing churches in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other cities. By 1973, his membership increased to almost 3,000 people. During this time, he was extremely popular with other religious leaders, politicians, and some celebrities. It's interesting that he could fool those groups so easily. He started to use fear tactics to his members to keep them loyal. For example, one of his female members died in a car accident. So he told his congregation that he had asked her to meditate for a few minutes before she left in her car. She refused, and Jones said that's why she was killed. So kind of like an idea of reference, but he was using it to manipulate his followers. By this point, he was having multiple affairs. Jones would tell his wife that he needed to have sex with other women in order to retain his spiritual powers. And this resulted in Jones fathering a number of children. This is right out of the deranged cult leader handbook. Jones started to distinguish his spiritual beliefs from traditional beliefs that the members may have had coming into the congregation. He started to say that he was a deity, that he needed to be worshipped by the members. Interestingly, he told his wife that he was an atheist. So if a deity is an atheist, does that mean they don't believe that they exist? I'm not sure how that works. His drug use started to increase dramatically. This caused his eyes to be red, so he started wearing sunglasses all the time. He explained that the reason he wore them 
was because he was so holy that if somebody looked into his unshielded eyes, they would burst into flames. I bet his optometrist was scared of him. That's one appointment you don't want to see on your calendar if you're an optometrist. I imagine it's kind of like the fire-breathing dragon's dentist, right? So maybe they were in a support group together. Jones started to draw scrutiny from newspapers. There were allegations that he was mistreating members. And this brings us to the timeline of his crimes. By 1977, the attention of the media was too much for Jones to handle. He was afraid of losing power. He moved his congregation to an agricultural settlement in the country of Guyana. He referred to the settlement as Jonestown. Construction had started on Jonestown several years before. Jones proclaimed the settlement was a sanctuary from the media and a socialist paradise. The Jonestown settlement would expand to over 900 people as Jones targeted vulnerable individuals, for example, those with substance use problems and histories of crime. Jones continued to perpetrate fraud, claiming to have the ability to heal people and predict the future. He staged these elaborate events, which really had a number of like magic tricks that he would use. Even the members that helped him pull off these fraudulent exercises believed Jones was a deity. They thought he was saving his real supernatural powers for important tasks. So this really borders on delusional itself, if not totally there. Jones held drinking the poison rehearsals. So he would have like liquid that the members would drink and he would tell them that it may be poison, it may not be. And he kept doing this to condition them essentially to end their lives at some point. So he wanted to see from these exercises who would be trouble, how they would react when confronted with the end of their lives. And this really facilitated what he would do later on. He used brutal methods to keep members in line, including drugging them and causing them sleep deprivation. He told them that he had infiltrated the community with secret agents who would come to them and say things like they wanted to escape or the living conditions were terrible. If the members did not report these communications or they agreed with them, they would be severely punished. So he really kept everybody separate and somewhat paranoid of each other. Jones also didn't allow talking for a significant portion of each day when voice recordings were being played across the settlement. All these factors really made it difficult for members to band together against Jones. Other members were kept in line by Jones' stories of how dangerous leaving the settlement would be. He told them the jungle was full of mercenaries and tigers. Makes me wonder, wouldn't the tigers eat the mercenaries? I guess they were the tiger-proof variety of mercenaries. Jones also had a way of maintaining control over his inner circle. He forced them to prove their loyalty by signing blank power of attorney forms, false confessions that they had harmed children, and statements saying they had conspired to overthrow the government of the United States. He would hand them a firearm so their fingerprints would be on it, and then he would take it back and say he was going to frame them for murder using that weapon. Evidently, the conditions at Jonestown were horrible. It was hot, there were snakes and mosquitoes, and they could not grow much food because of the nature of the soil in the jungle. Many had expressed an interest in leaving, but again, they were afraid of Jones. There were many who stayed voluntarily. Some believed that being in Jonestown gave them a sense of purpose, expanded their understanding of reality, and alleviated feelings of isolation. A dispute over a child who was in Jonestown named John Victor Stellan, as well as complaints of several relatives of Jonestown members, started to attract the attention of California Congressman Leo Ryan. By the summer of 1978, there were also complaints of substandard living conditions and violations of human rights. Leo Ryan, reporters, and several relatives of those in the congregation traveled to Guyana in November 1978. On November 17, they entered Jonestown, and the group noticed there was a lot of tension there. But overall, that evening, the group did form a positive impression of Jonestown. Evidently, Jones had coached the members of the congregation and told them to say positive things and told them how to defuse popular accusations he thought would be occurring because those accusations, of course, were true. Eventually, though, some of the members communicated to that group that they wanted to leave Jonestown. One member specifically used a note. He handed a note to one of the reporters. So this really indicates the level of fear that some of the members had. The group noticed that Jim Jones appeared paranoid, weak, and disorganized. Evidently, he would go on these tangential rants talking about how the United States government was out to get him. 
the next day, November 18, one of the members attacked Leo Ryan with a knife, which understandably eroded the positive impression formed the night before. After this, Ryan's group and 14 defectors drove to the airfield intending to start their journey home. They also had with them a man named Larry Layton. He was posing as a defector. As the group was boarding two airplanes, a group of armed men from Jonestown arrived on a trailer being pulled by a tractor. They opened fire on the group. They killed Ryan, three members of the media, and one defector. At the same time, Larry Layton, who was already in an aircraft with some of the group members, opened fire with a pistol. Larry Layton would eventually go to prison for that attack. He was the only member of this crime that actually served any time in prison. He would be released in 2002. After the attack, Jones told his members they had no choice but to end their lives. So Jones made sure that his soldiers killed Leo Ryan. He did this not to protect the secrets that Ryan would have revealed, but rather to create a narrative whereby the members believed that the U.S. government would be sending troops to wipe out Jonestown. So he was essentially fulfilling the conspiracy theory that he had been pushing for such a long time. Jones told the members that it wasn't worth living like this, and he said that without him, life had no meaning. He said that after they died, they would live with him on another planet. I find this interesting. This was supposed to motivate them to end their lives, right? So I guess they wanted to live with him on another planet. You would think that they would just step back and say, hey, you go ahead and we'll catch up with you later. But of course, there were other factors at work here. Jones' guards were standing around with crossbows and firearms. Members of Jones' inner circle prepared poison. It was flavor aid, cyanide, and Valium. This is where the popular phrase, drank the Kool-Aid, comes from, even though, of course, they were using the lower-cost flavor aid. Jones had the guards start with the children because he knew that once the children died, the parents would lose hope and be more agreeable to end their own lives. As the poisoning went on, Jones continued to talk and pressure the members to take the poison. There's this theory that those who would not comply were injected with the compound. The evidence for this is the presence of injection sites on some of the members. Jones died of a single gunshot wound to the head. The best evidence supports that it was self-inflicted. By the time it was over, 909 people would be dead, and roughly 304 of those individuals were under the age of 18. There's another theory about Jones that he had been sick for six weeks. He had a temperature of 100 for that long. So that may have been a factor in this as well, but that hasn't been confirmed as far as I know. Moving to the mental health and personality factors now. So before I get specifically to the behavior of Jim Jones, I want to take a quick look at the definition of a cult because it's pretty clear that he was operating one. There are many definitions out there, but the one I use has seven items. A cult is authoritarian and manipulative. It uses mind control strategies. It tends to target middle class citizens. It is based around communal goals. It uses aggressive conversion methods. It attempts to indoctrinate members using a system. And it employs a relatively new belief system in the culture of origin. So all seven of these seem to line up pretty well with what we see in Jonestown. Now, the classic starting place for cult leaders like Jim Jones would be narcissism. It's easy to align his behavior with eight of the nine symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder. So grandiosity, fantasies of unlimited power, a belief that one is special, and arrogance are all met by the fact that Jones established Jonestown. So he established this community and he named it after himself. Also, he thought he was a deity. So again, all four of these are covered with that. An excessive need for admiration is the next symptom. We see this all the time with Jones. A sense of entitlement could be supported by the fact he stole from members, and really he did whatever he wanted. He was manipulative, and that's another symptom. Probably this is the characteristic that really stands out the most with Jim Jones. We see Jim Jones had no empathy, no real empathy anyway. He was good at feigning empathy. And we look at the symptom of having envy or believing other people envy you. This is the only one that's not really clear with Jim Jones. I don't know if he would have manifested this even if he had it because he was able to obtain everything he wanted. So it makes sense that he would have been envious, but we just don't see it in this context. So I left that one out. So again, eight of nine symptoms. 
Now, some cult leaders also appear to be psychopathic. More specifically, they have a number of traits from primary psychopathy. We see this as well here with Jim Jones. It's not surprising that his behavior aligns with antisocial personality disorder because of that disorder's relationship to psychopathy. We see alignment with five of the seven symptoms. Repeated criminal behavior. Now, he wasn't held accountable for a lot of the wrongdoing he did as a child, but he did involve himself in a number of crimes. Deceitfulness. We see this was really constant with Jim Jones. Aggression and a disregard for safety. Murder qualifies for both of these. A lack of remorse. There was no evidence of remorse at any point with Jones. And with impulsivity and irresponsibility, here we don't really see an alignment. Like many people with primary psychopathy, these symptoms don't really seem to appear, even though otherwise they qualify for antisocial personality disorder. Now, after looking at narcissism and antisocial personality disorders, they don't seem to capture all his behavior. For example, he had extreme paranoia, maybe even delusions, irrational thinking, and an obsession with death. There are a few possibilities here to explain this. He could have had a comorbid psychotic disorder, but he also consumed a lot of substances. So much that this could have led him to paranoid thinking. As far as the delusions, it's hard to know if he was delusional or lying, which is a common problem when somebody lies all the time. So, kind of stepping back from this, we see two key takeaways from the tragedy at Jonestown. First, Jones wasn't particularly convincing to most people that met him. Many people just thought he was a garden variety con artist. But what he understood, just like all cult leaders, is the importance of finding individuals with whom you can connect. And once they are identified, it's about control. He was a master manipulator. He controlled every aspect of the lives of those members in California and in Jonestown. Second, what happened in Jonestown is better described as a homicide on a large scale as opposed to a suicide. Without Jones, none of those people would have died. He caused all of it. Those that complied believed that they were going to be murdered by the government, and they also believed that they would be on this new planet with Jones. So Jones had a frightening combination of characteristics that made him incredibly deadly and resulted in this horrible tragedy. I know whenever I talk about controversial cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.